Hello, Mike. Hi. Uh, thanks for uh, making the time to answer some of my uh, questions. You are a uh, you are Dr. Mike Berry. You are a reader at Cardiff University School of Journalism, Media and Cultural Studies. I wanted to talk to you today uh, because you have, with your um, colleague, um, Greg Philo, worked for many, many years, I think it's been nearly 20 years now or, or more, about the way mainstream media, uh, and especially UK, I guess, mainstream media, um, talks about the Israel-Palestine question. You released a book with Mike, in two, with Mike, with Greg, with Greg. in 2004, <laughs> called Bad News from Israel. And you released another book in 2011 called More Bad News from Israel. Um, I wanted to first ask you, because you are, I mean, I, you can tell me, but I think there hasn't been many studies uh, really focusing solely on, on sort of the coverage of Israel-Palestine in the mainstream media. So you and Greg are two of the foremost, in a way, specialists uh, in, in the issue. We hear, I mean, we know how, how important the narrative is when it comes to Israel-Palestine. Mm -hmm. We know how important propaganda uh, plays uh, a part in, in justifying sometimes some of the actions of in a way, both parties. And we know that Israel has bara, propaganda um, is very, very sophisticated. Um, so, for example, what's happening now, we've seen that, uh, I mean, some people call it genocide. To actually carry a genocide, you have first to dehumanize an entire group of people, either through media or through other, other you know, means. And Israel is very good at that. But I was wondering if you could tell us briefly about the two books, Bad News from Israel and More Bad News from Israel. Your research, uh, first, how did you approach it, such re okay. research? What is, the, in a way, the science and the methodology behind it? And what did you, in a way, find out? Because, sorry, last thing, Israel <laughs> often says, for example, that the BBC is biased towards the Palestinians. So I want you to ask you about what you found uh, after, you know, thorough research. Okay, yeah, thank you very much for the introduction. Um, the, one, the one thing I would say that I didn't completely agree with is actually there has been a lot of, this is actually an area that has been very, very extensively um, researched um, by, by researchers all across the world. But I think our approach was different because of the fact that most research just focuses on media content. So it says, okay, let's analyze what appears in, in the news media. Let's transcribe it. Let's look at the narratives, the points of view. Let's unpack the language. And all of that is good. But what we've tried to do in our various studies is study what we describe as the whole circuit of communication. So we want to study both how messages are produced and what are, what's the context in which you know, news reporting takes place, what are the, the various different structural constraints that journalists work under. We also, of course, look at the content, the next kind of stage, you know, what, what kind of product comes out of that. But then we also are interested in saying, well, how does that affect public knowledge and attitudes? And of course, that kind of question of how media affects how people think about the, the social world is, is that kind of million dollar question that relatively little research actually does. So um, our analysis of um, you know, the, the, the context under which media was produced involved lots of interviews with leading journalists in order to understand you know, what pressures they worked under and the various constraints. Um, we uh, did a lot of analysis, as I say, of media content itself, where we use what's called thematic analysis. And we looked at the mass audience bulletins on um, ITV and BBC, because those are the ones, because they have the most number of people watching, that have the big impact on public opinion. So those are the ones that we wanted to concentrate on. And we concentrated primarily on TV news, because at at the, the time around, um, you know, 
early 2000s, most research tended to suggest that that was the key source of information on world news for about 80 percent of the population. Obviously, now with the arrival of the Internet and social media, things have changed. And maybe we'll get into a little bit of that later on. But certainly when we did these initial studies, we concentrated on TV news. And in order to understand methodologically how this affected um, public opinion and public attitudes, what what we did was use a mixture of surveys and focus groups uh, with audiences in the UK, the US um, and Germany in order to kind of unpack what people understood about the conflict and can try and trace that back to the various sources of information that they accessed and used. Um, we had lots of input in this from senior journalists who sat in on our, our focus groups, our audience groups with members of the public, people like Paul Adams, George Alagaya, Brian Hanrahan from the BBC, and um, Lindsay Hilsom at Channel 4. And the purpose of our studies was not to kind of criticise individual journalists. Um, we try wherever possible to actually avoid kind of naming individual journalists, but it was rather to kind of think about how the various constraints and pressures in the production of news impact uh, coverage and what impact this has on public knowledge and understanding. So our first set of studies looked at the second intifada, and this this produced a number of key findings, certainly in terms of kind of what the coverage looked like. One of the um, kind of most clear findings was that there was a very, very strong focus on decontextualized images of violence. So, for instance, in our first sample at the beginning of the Intifada, about 28 percent of the coverage just focused on these kind of decontextualized images of bombings and, and shootings and uh, military attacks. And, um, you know, when we asked journalists, you know, why, why is there this such a strong emphasis on decontextualized images of, of violence? George Alagaya said to us, that um, you know, I'm constantly being told by my um, by my editors that the um, you know the average member of the public has got a very short attention span, and so what we want to focus on is bang bang, i.e., images, dramatic images of violence, and to kind of sideline explainers. So analysis of the conflict. So. The big reason for these decontextualized images of violence is because of the fact that, that the news organizations are, are in a, a very competitive scramble for audience ratings and, and for viewers. Even at the BBC, you know, there's a perception that you have to keep up audience numbers. That's important to justify the license fee. Um, and so that that kind of pushes you know, towards a kind of coverage that's seen to kind of drag and, you know, engage and pull in viewers. But as we'll see, what actually happens is it that those kind of decontextualized images often leave people very confused about the conflict. So it actually has the, the opposite and actually um, push people away because they find it uh, very distressing and they don't really understand what's going on. A second key finding, and this I think is really kind of key, is that... Um, when we looked at the, the second intifada, there was almost nothing in reporting about the origins or the, the history um, of the conflict. So in our first sample of over three and a half thousand lines of transcribed news texts, we found only about 17 mentioned anything about the, the history of the conflict. Um, and of course, this strongly disadvantaged the Palestinian perspective of the conflict, which is rooted in key historic events, such as the loss of their lands and homes in 1940. And the fact that they've been living under military rule since 1967. Um, the third key finding we 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 discovered was that there was very little information in news broadcast about what the military occupation actually meant for Palestinians. Things such as restrictions on movement, the loss of their home, land and water, uh, the dual system of laws that were in place uh, in the occupied territories for uh, Palestinians and Israeli settlements, the use of arbitrary detention, uh, pass laws, um, torture, etc., etc. All of these kind of, you know, very, very serious uh, impacts of living under military occupation were not uh, were, were were barely touched on in in reporting, and this, of course, again, kind of very much disadvantaged the, the Palestinian case. And as as we'll see when I talk about the audience results, meant that people couldn't understand why the Palestinians were angry or or why the conflict was continuing. Um, the fourth key finding that we found was that um, in the absence of kind of context or history, the conflict tended to be described as being just a kind of cycle of violence um, where there were tit for tat killings. Um, one of the journalists we interviewed said it's presented as a, a very large blood feud. And if there isn't a large amount of blood, 
that it's not reported. But you can't really explain the kind of genesis or the continuation of a kind of long, long lasting and, and very complex um, dispute like this by just saying that, you know, yesterday one side bombed and then the other side, you know, bombed today. It, it's, you know, you really do need in order to be able to make the conflict um, understandable to people to really get into some of those kind of, you know, the historical detail and the kind of different um complex kind of political factors that underlie the the, the, the context and um underlie the conflict we didn't find that um right. can i can i was... actually can i ask you a sure. question because you um, without it again without giving names of journalists um looks like to me that the journalists even like high profile journalists knew what they were doing right some of them said like yeah we in a way it's like spectacle news we need more audience so we can't really spend much time on the context um so thinking that they were aware of this, did some of the journalists said like, you know, I wish I would do it differently or I wish I could, or, or at least they understood what they were being a part of in a way? Um, I think, you know, some journalists are aware of this, but the, you know, the, the pressures on, on journalists in this area are, um, you know, you know, are considerable. And I think journalists find it difficult to, you know, to talk about the Palestinian perspective. And this was obviously, you know, one of the key findings of the report. It was considered, you know, quite controversial to, you know, talk about, you know, what the occupation involved and the history of the conflict. And of course, with the history of the conflict, it's also difficult because so much of it is disputed and journalists have to work within the framework of a two or three minute report. And so they, they, they kind of worry whether they can present, you know, the both sides of the kind of key moments in the conflict. So that is a challenge. Brian Hanrahan actually said to us, you know, the, the key challenge is to think about how you drip feed context into the, um, you know, in 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 the confines of a, of a brief kind of maybe two or three minute package. So there is that kind of issue as well. And, um, so anyway, in between the two books, uh, it was 2004 and 2011. So it's seven years, if I count um, well uh, did you find i mean the, the second book focused a lot on what was called operation cast lead uh, another mm -hmm. bombing of gaza between 2008 and 2009 in december for about three weeks or four weeks if i remember correctly um, so seven years after the first book did you find what was it exactly like the same patterns when you spoke to journalists did they come back with you know could you have, in a way, just done a copy paste of the first book, or did you find some some changes in the the, the news well, reporting? I've got a couple of other points to make about the interfile, and then I'll talk about how those how we see some you know continuities in the coverage between the two conflicts. So. Um, you had the cycle of violence, but you also had within this, and this is something that we saw as well within the, um, you know, the Gaza war was the, 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 within this cycle of violence framework, it tended to be presented as the Israelis were responding or retaliating to what had been done to them as the Palestinians. So in one sample, we found the Israelis are described as retaliating to what had been done to them about um, six times as often as the Palestinians. We found more time given to the Israeli perspectives in the reporting of the Intifada. And these perspectives tend to be given a higher status by journalism. So reporting was much more likely to be structured around Israeli perspectives. Um, so for instance, uh, you know, for instance, in 2002, the um, journalists, uh, Israeli soldiers were described as being in good spirits and their leaders determined to press on with the offensive. So there was a tendency to kind of see, to br br report from the Israeli point of view. But we didn't find any kind of reports at that time saying, you know, Palestinian fighters were, were you know, were in, in involved in being... Uh, involved in a struggle to try and throw off the occupation of their lands and, you know, to resist the system of apartheid. We didn't, in, in that sense, one, the, the news media tends to report within one perspective, the Israeli perspective, much more. And we also finally, kind of the final thing that we found in, on the Intifada, and this is something that I kind of bring forward to both um you know, the uh, the reporting of the, the war in Gaza in 2008, 2009, and the current conflict is that Israeli casualties were given more, t more, more airspace than pa Palestinian casualties on a kind of per capita basis, and different 
kind of language was used, and the language is all, always off, off, is, is obviously always very important. So certain words like atrocity, murder, lynch mob, barbarically killed, were used to describe the, the deaths of Israelis, but not Palestinians. So it was very different um, language used. Just quickly before I move on to Gaza, I just wanted to talk about how that affects public opinion, because this is something that's not actually discussed. And we were able to kind of really kind of drill down into that with our analysis. And, and what that's we found, crucial. Of yeah. Course. And what mm. we found is that the absences in media reporting were very strongly mirrored in audience understandings. So relatively few people knew anything about the history of the conflict that we spoke to in our audience groups, um, particularly events like 1948 and 1967. I mean, only a very small minority knew about these. There was little understanding about the military occupation um, and, and what that involved, such as human rights abuses. Many people we spoke to in the focus groups were very surprised to learn that there were past laws in the occupied territories which restricted people's movement. Many didn't even, even understand what a military occupation meant. So they just thought that the land was occupied in the way, for instance, that a bathroom might be occupied. They didn't realise that it involved a whole system of, of military control and kind of suppression of, of human rights. Um, there was a very, very common uh, perspe perspective that this wasn't a military occupation. This was a border dispute between two states. And there was also great confusion about very basic facts of the conflict, such as who the settlers were. Some people more in some groups we spoke to, more people actually thought it was the Palestinians that it was who were the settlers and the Palestinians were, were occupying the territories. So because these things weren't explained in news coverage, they left people, members of the audience, very, very um uh, very confused. And this also meant that there was little knowledge of the political dimensions of the conflict and how it could be brought to an end. Um, so one of the people in one of our audience groups said, oh, you know, uh, the whole conflict would stop if the Palestinians kept their kids inside and stopped them throwing stones. And then when it when somebody else in the group kind of explained about the occupation, the person immediately changed their point of view. And they said, well, cri crikey, um, if that was you, you'd be out there throwing stones yourself. So the absence of context and of, of explanation leaves people very, very confused about why the conflict is ongoing, how it might be resolved. And therefore, there's no real pressure on, on political leaders to take those particular steps that would be necessary to bring the conflict to an end. And I think that's what's really important. If we kind of move forward then to 2008, um, again, we see very, very kind of con you know strong continuities in coverage. Um, at that time, there were very, very two clear competing explanations for that particular war. The Israelis argued that they needed to stop weapons smuggling and rocket attacks from Gaza. And the Palestinians you know, were arguing they needed to stop the blockade, the siege of Gaza, and they needed to end the occupation of the West Bank and have their own state. Now, when we looked at BBC and ITV coverage, we found that the, the, that the Israeli perspective really predominated. It was given much, much more airtime than the Palestinian view of, you know, why the conflict was ongoing. Um, and often we would find that, you know, when the is uh, when the journalists reported on you know the, the terrible scenes of bloodshed and death in Gaza, they would often you know immediately insert the Israeli rationale for why the Israelis were actually conducting that particular war in a way that they would not conduct you know not insert the passion the Palestinian you know rationale for why they were actually um, you know fighting within the conflict, and so. One one side's view of the conflict was given much more airspace and it, it tended to structure coverage again, as in the Intifada. Um, and what we found when we spoke to members of the public again was that um, the majority of the people, when, when, we, when we looked at the war in Gaza, actually blamed both sides equally for the conflict. And that was quite interesting. We, we found that in surveys. And so we, we tried in our focus groups to, to unpack that. Why did, why did people, you know, clearly these terrible scenes of, you know, destruction and loss of life, you know, deaths of um, civilians and children, you know, why, why were they kind of blaming both sides equally? And the key factor for that was that people tended having watched the news to assume that it was the Palestinians who, you know, that the, the, the suffering of the Palestinians was was awful, but many people believe they had brought it on themselves because they 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 saw the Palestinians as initiating the violence through rocket attacks. They thought the Palestinians were inflexible and just wanted to destroy Israel. And so they tended to blame Hamas 
for the Palestinian deaths, although they they thought you know sometimes that the, the the attacks were disproportionate. So it's really about how the news provides frameworks of explanation and understanding, and then. Um, how that then filters down to kind of public perception and and who people see as legitimate and who people, you know, um, hold responsible for the continuation of the war and and the terrible suffering within it. Thanks, Mike. I mean, you said a lot of very, very interesting things. Um, The um, focus group, you mentioned this person who um, thought, you know, if the Palestinian stopped throwing stones, the conflict will end tomorrow. And then after someone, in a way, educated him, he switched, he switched very quickly. Um, and I've found this as well uh, throughout my work on Israel-Palestine, even with like close members of my family. When I came back from Palestine in 2007, uh, I'd, I'd made some films and interviews and I sat my dad down, my mother down. They were like, but have we been lied to then for so many years by the, the media? And like in, a very, in very simple terms, they told me like, so in a way, the Israelis are bad and the Palestinians are good, right? And it's, it shows that in a way, with like basic education on the issue, and that's where I truly believe that if people truly knew what was happening on the ground, um, it will help put pressure on political leaders and it will actually help potentially end uh, and find peace in, in Israel-Palestine. So in a way, the media and the way the mainstream media reports on, on, the, on the issue plays a big part in the sort of status quo and the, the occupation of Palestine continuing. Don't you think so? Well, I mean, this is one of the point. One of the points we wanted to make was essentially that um, the media is inhibiting a broad public debate about how the conflict can be brought to an end. If you don't explain, you know, what the key issues are um, within the conflict, you don't explain that one side is actually living under military rule and and, and the consequences of this for that side. People. I mean, has a number of things. One is people don't understand how the conflict can be brought to an end. But another thing is when you have you know, coverage that's very focused on these kind of decontextualized images for violence, it turns people off and people turn away from the coverage because they find it, they don't understand it, they find it distressing and they tend to avoid news. So you get kind of news avoidance behaviors relating to the conflict. And of course, the other issue is, it, it kind of pre- prevents, as I say, a broad public debate about what needs to be done, and and it's and it, and it prevents there being pressure on politicians to actually, um, you know, you know, go for the particular policies and to push the policies. You know, th- these are not new policies. This is this particular framework has been around for decades. You know, the notion of the two state solution, um, you know, uh, a Palestinian state in 22 percent of historic Palestine, some kind of resolution to the the kind of um, return of refugees, you know, the, the shared status of Jerusalem. You know, this is what the framework has been agreed on by all international parties. But there is very little public understanding of that and the need, you know, to uh, to um, you know to end the occupation and how central the occupation is to the continuation of violence, because it, it's just not there in, in news broadcasts. I mean, obviously, it, we're going to be doing some research looking at audience understandings um, relatively soon. And one of the interesting questions to be able to look at there is, as as I kind of said earlier, is the fact that now there is a broader range of sources for people to get access to. People can see more information on social media from a wider range of different sources. And so I think the ability for the the mainstream news to completely, or or not completely, but very largely dominate public understanding is less. Having said that, we shouldn't um, we shouldn't overestimate that. And, you know, the BB, what the BB, what comes out of the BBC and what comes out of CNN and what comes out of Fox and what comes out of the, the newspapers is still very, very important. Those are still the most widely shared sources um, on social media. Um, but I, but there are also other sources that are now available to people. And although, you know, we haven't been able to get journalists into Gaza, international journalists, people are able also to see Al Jazeera. They're also able to get access to firsthand reports from people there and, and other commentators. So people do have 
you know, a wider access to information, but how that's changing public views of the legitimacy of the two sides and what's going on in the conflict is something we want to explore soon, but I can't give you any kind of definitive information on that yet. So do you actually think that the, in a way, social media and in a way, influencers, uh, there, there, there are people now with the accounts of more than 10, 20, 30 million followers mm. that are actually showing what's happening in Palestine, including uh, journalists and photographers in Palestine, you know, in Gaza and Palestine itself, um, that have massive following. Uh, do you think, in a way, social media could influence? a change in mainstream media attitudes toward Israel-Palestine? Or is it too early to say? Or yeah, I mean, that's a good question. I can't answer that. I mean, we do know that social media is integrated into the news gathering techniques of all the major, you know, news organizations. You know, they'll, you know, they all have social media hubs where information is coming in, you know, and although journalists haven't been able to get into Gaza, that that shouldn't stop them from actually, you know, providing you know, coverage of what's actually happening in that region. There's enough other kind of coverage from the agencies from Al Jazeera, you know, and first-hand footage. And as I say, they all have social media hubs where they spend a lot of time kind of looking at what information is being posted on social media. I mean, this is not just at the national level. I mean, one of my... Um, students in one of my classes the other day was talking about you know she was just working for a little regional news organization and a huge amount of their you know not of this particular conflict but just about local news and such a huge amount of it was being sourced from social media obviously social media has lots of uh, advantages uh, you know, and, and lots of um, attractive features for news organizations it's cheap uh, you don't have to have a reporter there you can get access to all these People, but obviously one of the issues in then is verification of information. You know, in what sense can we be sure that this is coming from who we think it is? But of course, there are many Palestinian journalists on the ground who have uh, official, um, you know, uh, accounts, uh, social media accounts on things like Twitter, where they could source information from. So clearly, it's in in some senses, I think it presents challenges you know major challenges to the legitimacy of big media organizations in 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 the fact that there is this other information that is online that um, citizens are able to get access to and is able to work very very quickly um, and is also able sometimes to kind of challenge um and some of the reporting that's done by media mainstream media organizations so the arrival of social media um different forms of social media particularly i think you know twitter and instagram are very significant and obviously tiktok now these are you know very significant platforms that are presenting major challenges for news organizations as well as opportunities you know to source more widely um in conflict situations i i want to wrap up but i want to ask you a couple more questions like do you sure. think in a way do you think i mean it looks like to me that the mainstream media really should be held accountable for in a way playing a big part in what you said um is preventing a broad public debate on the palestine question so in a way as as you know licensed fee payers and as citizens how can we hold mainstream media accountable and and finally, and maybe you you can answer the second part of the question first. Um, October seventh was a couple of months ago, and I know you haven't had time to do you know you know deep research on on the on this topic yet. But I guess what I've seen in the mainstream media, even if I've tried to avoid it for a few weeks because the reporting was so horrible, I just couldn't stand it, um, is that. Israel's actions, really genocidal actions, and, and the, the pictures we see from Palestine, the videos we see in social media are so horrific. Uh, and, you know, we are now at more than 22,000, I think, Palestinian deaths, uh, more than 8,000 children, more than 55,000 injuries, 65% of northern Gaza being totally destroyed. It, it, it's actually uh, the actions the actions of a, of a mad lunatic state as some people call it and it's i find it i mean the the reporting at the beginning sort of first few weeks was all about hamas atrocities but slowly what's happening on the ground is so mad and crazy and horrific or hor horrific that 
even in the mainstream media, we've seen changes on the BBC, the way they ask questions on Sky News. So I don't know if you remember my first question was that how can we help yeah, hold yeah, the media sure, accountable? Sure. And do you think that the, the further Israel goes into its rampage, the, the hardest it is for the mainstream media to actually, I mean, not support it, but like not look at it? Well, I mean, there's a couple of issues. First of all, dear, what, what can the public do? And that's obviously a crucial issue. What, what can we do? I mean, the BBC is, is, is a public broadcaster. It's, it, it kind of answers to all of us, and, it, and it's supposed to represent you know, the nation. It, that's the nature of, of a public broadcaster and the whole public broadcasting system. It's there to, um, you know, supposed to be free of commercial pressures, supposed to represent a wide range of views, provide a forum for all major opinions, and speak for all of us in, in the country. And, I mean... What I would always suggest people to do is to write in, to complain. I mean, you may feel that, you know, you only have one small voice, but the BBC does take account of um, letter writing campaigns and complaints that are put in, you know, in relation to coverage. So it is our broadcaster and I would always encourage people to to write in. And if you feel some, uh, you know, particular perspectives are not being covered or, you know, you feel the, the reporting is, is slanted in a particular direction, I would, I would, you know, write in factually, be polite, but point it out and, and, and demand that the BBC lives up to its own stated mandate to represent all points of view fairly and, and to be balanced. Um, on the second question of, um, you know, the, the issue about how it's reporting this current conflict, um, I'd say, you know, there are many continuities from the past. Um, you know, certainly we, we've seen, relatively speaking, relatively little kind of coverage of the context of, you know, what happened on October the, the, the 7th. And famously or, or infamously, depending on what perspective you look at, um, the, the, uh, the, the United Nations Secretary General said, and I'll quote him directly here, um, the, the, the October the 7th attacks didn't happen in a vacuum. They have seen their land steadily devoured by settlements and, and plagued by violence. Their economy stifled and their homes demolished. Their hopes for a political solution to this plight have been vanishing. So the UN Secretary General, you know, immediately pointed, well, not immediately, but, you know, in the, the aftermath of October the 7th, pointed to the importance of context and the need to kind of deal with that context. But what we tended to find when we looked at particularly broadcast coverage is that it didn't provide this this coverage there was very little about you know the blockade the um you know the siege of gaza that's been ongoing for 16 years there's very little about you know the the occupation of the west bank and that the very serious human rights situation that creates for palestinians and particularly the uptick in 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 violence against palestinians that's happened since um uh you know the 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 kind of far-right government that's come to power in in israel now these things are not given very very much attention at all in broadcasting so i think that's doing the public a disservice by not giving them that context um and and what's tended to happen when when it's been talked about on a routine basis by broadcasters it's tend to kind of start the conflict on october the 7th so you would get statements such as the bbc on bbc online on the 23rd of november said the conflict began when Gaza-based gunmen from Hamas attacked southern Israel on October 7th, killing about 1,200 people and taking 250, 40 people, um, 240 people hostage. Um, of course, the BBC there is starting the conflict on October the 7th, but the Palestinians would see themselves as resisting the actions of, of, of Israel going back many decades within the war. So that's one kind of issue but we've also kind of seen very different use of language again so that certain words such as atrocity murder massacre slaughter have been almost used i mean i'm talking about journalists using these words now not in reported statements from from officials but journalists using these these words almost exclusively to refer to the deaths of, of israelis but not the deaths of palestinians and i think you know there's a serious question to ask why why are the deaths of palestinians reported in such a different way to the deaths of Israelis. Um, and you also obviously brought up, you know, the issue of genocide and the BBC, the BBC in 2006 did a um, impartiality review um, of its coverage. And one of the things that it said in that is that the BBC must, uh, must ground its reporting and its kind of use of language in international law. 
And we find relatively little discussion of international law in, in, in news broadcasts. The BBC has, has access to you know, an almost limitless number of experts on, on, on international law that it could bring in to talk about the conflict. But these are rarely used. And obviously, the international law is absolutely vital to, to kind of discussion of the kind of ongoing conflict. But it, it, it doesn't. You know, it's not a central foregrounded part of coverage. And obviously you raise the issue of genocide. Um, and as we noted, Craig Mokeba, the um, the New York office, it was the head of the New York office of the High Commissioner for Human Rights, um, resigned um, over um, over the war, which he described as a kind of textbook case of genocide. And when we found that wasn't even covered on BBC News. And, it, and you know, I mean, Accusations of genocide are about as serious as serious as it gets in relation to international law. And I think the BBC really has a responsibility to to investigate and report on such claims when they're made by uh, highly credible sources, such as um, UN officials or um, you know, academic experts in genocide who, uh, who a number have made this particular ac accusation. I think the BBC does have a responsibility to investigate these. And also to, um, you know, to, to hold politicians to account over these particular um, claims and allegations. Mike, um, thanks, uh, thanks a million. Um, I mean, we could have spoken for for, for hours because I think there's so much more to your to your research, to you, yours and, and Greg's research, and I think people should. Uh, really get the books, you know, um, bad news from Israel and more bad news from Israel, because like, if you want to understand how the mainstream media uh, plays a big part, again, in keeping people, in a way, uneducated about the Palestine-Israel issue, uh, the both of the books are just um, uh, very important ones. So um, thank you again. Um, and, um, and uh, obviously, uh, if more, you know, more research is done about the current uh, massacre, genocide, uh, I'd love to, to talk to you um, again, Mike. Thanks. No problem. Thank you very much for having me on and um, I hope you're having a good new year. Thanks. You too, Mike. OK, cheers. Bye bye.